All right. So welcome to the Hubbard Free Library presenting Black Cat and Other Stories with Sam Weber and Earl Shuttleworth with an introduction by Ken. I'm just going to go through our usual disclaimer that this program is being recorded. And if you have any questions, we will have a Q&A session at the end. So if you have any questions, be sure to post them in the chat. Or at that time, we may ask you to uh, unmute yourselves and ask the question that way. And once again, if you want a copy reserved, please message me. And if you're interested in, uh, actually, I'll let Ken get to that part. <laughs> you can always email the library at hfl at msln.net or give us a call at 207-622-6582. And let us know then if you decide at a later date that you want to reserve a copy. And I will say copies are limited. So I'm going to pass the baton to Ken. So Ken, if you want to unmute yourself. Yep. Okay. Good. On behalf of the trustees of the Harvard Free Library and its staff, we welcome you to our annual fund kickoff event. My name is Ken Young. I am the president of the Board of Trustees of the Harvard Free Library. <clears throat> our annual fund is our first line fundraising event. This year's goal is $40,000. The annual fund is our way of asking the community, those of you on this Zoom and others in the community, to keep your support for the Hubbard coming. This 141 year old library is open and thriving because of the commitments and contributions made by members of the community. And this is your year to, to do that again, if you would, please. Our program this evening is the story of Sam Weber's early days in Hollowell, beginning in 1941, Black Cat and Other Stories. Sam is, as many of you know, the city's historian. He's a longtime resident. 1941, and a, a longtime member of Hubbard's Board of Trustees. We're proud as a member, of, as a Board of Trustees to include him in the list of people who've worked to keep the Hubbard growing and sustainable over the many years of its existence. Earl Shuttleworth, who will be with Sam uh, tonight talking about the book, is a Hubbard trustee and the main state historian. So we have essentially two historians, the city historian and the state historian. Hard to believe that one small town in Maine can be so blessed. Sam will uh, Earl will join Sam in talking about Sam's book and, and his experiences in Hollowell as a young man and during the years of World War II. I'm, at this point, I'll turn it over to Sam and Does that work? No? Oh, there you go. Okay, sorry. Um, one of those technical glitches. Uh, Sam and, and Earl will have a colloquy back and forth, question and answers. At the end of their presentation, there'll be an opportunity for uh, questions from the staff, uh, from not the staff. You can all be staff by contributing to the annual fund. We'll list you especially as staff members, honorary staff members. Thanks very much. Go ahead, Earl and Sam, take it away. Thank you. Shuttleworth, and I have the pleasure of having Sam Weber with me this evening. And uh, we're celebrating, as uh, both Annie and Ken have told you, um, the publication by the library of uh, Sam's uh, wonderful book, Black Cat and Other Stories. Sam, my first question for you is what prompted you to write your recollections of Hollywood? Well, 
Marcos Park is the old called the bungalow and it was actually two houses that had been put together oh, yeah. and, uh, and, and so, Sam could you could you tell us a little bit about uh, Dr. Henry Clearwater okay Dr. Clearwater uh, well he's responsible for willing the uh, Clearwater Trust to the Harvard Free Library mm -hmm. and he was a patent medicine um, creator and marketer. <laughs> in fact, his uh, so-called lab were over, you know where the um, latest point was? Yes, sure. It was on, mostly on the upper floors. Of it. And uh, he wasn't really a doctor, <laughs> um, an MD, hmm. but he had a uh, PhD in uh, uh, clinical uh, pharmacy, uh -huh. which uh, had prepped him to create new medication. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, the biggest seller that he had was called Joint Ease. It could be, um, well, you could boil a teaspoon in water and then inhale it. <laughs> and Or if you put it on your skin, it would be absorbed by your skin and it would uh, cure about every um, malady that was in the world. <laughs> and uh, didn't he run into a little trouble with the Food and Drug Administration at some uh, point? He, uh, <laughs> he, um, the Food and Drug Administration finally found out that he wasn't a medical doctor. And they said, well, if you had a medical doctor on your staff, mm -hmm. that would not be as bad. But uh, he didn't. Right. And uh, he had a pretty big business because he uh, sold all of his Technical difficulty there. <laughs> yeah. Well, he sold all over the country, and he was really a great marketer. He had uh, all the radio stations. Well, they opened up in the twenties, mm -hmm. and he had ads on all the radio stations. Mm -hmm. uh, he offered extra things if you <laughs> bought his product, and he also advertised in the major newspapers across the United States. Now, so this brought in so much business that he had to have a full-time staff working for him. Uh, the new Hollow Library was large enough 
to hand, handle the many things that he sent out. Amazing. Now, Sam, you titled this Black Cat. Um, Black Cat was one of your pets, and you had another well, pet, I think, too. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> we, we had um, canaries. My mother had canaries and dicky birds. And uh, we didn't have a cat. So one early morning, I was walking down uh, Summer Street. Well, it wasn't paved at that time. I was walking down Summer Street. And I met this man that had a long black coat. And he said, hey, young man, <laughs> would you like a cat? <laughs> and he pulled out a uh, jet black cat <laughs> and gave it to me. I was all excited. I ran home. <laughs> and when my parents found out about it, when they woke up and everything, they said, you can't have that cat up here, <laughs> but we'll allow you temporarily to keep it downstairs, <laughs> and uh, I did. And then there was another Rick, who was a dog, it was a mongrel dog, <laughs> that my uh, grandmother brought over, and she said, every boy should have a dog. <laughs> and my parents, oh my God, <laughs> we didn't even ask for a dog. So uh, he, stayed with us a while because um, well, he had a funny little tail that went up in the air. And uh, one time my dad took him out at night and walked down Summer Street and there was a commotion. The dog ran over and uh, ran into a skunk. Oh, gosh. And the skunk let fly. Yeah. And my dad was wearing his uh, favorite raccoon coat. <laughs> it was destroyed. <laughs> right. I remember until it fell apart, it was under our screen porch. Our house had a raised porch that was uh, close in by screens. And uh, it was a great place to sleep during the summer. And uh, it got really hot and we'd move out there. But tell us about your first school. Where, where was that located? Uh, uh, first school was uh, located on the corner of Academy and uh, Middle Street. It originally had been the Hollow Academy. Mm. And then later on, it uh, became the Hollow High School. Mm -hmm. And then when the high school was built in 1920, uh, it became the primary school. Ah. <laughs> uh, it was an Italianate style building. It had a tower. Uh, we had to, well, when December 7th came, we all had to change mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, it was during the war, so everything turned upside down. And uh, well, anyway, school, all the girls lined up on the right. And all the boys lined up on the left, and we would march into the building. Uh, the right was the girls' playground. You weren't supposed to go on that side. <laughs> and the left was the boys' uh, playground. So, Sam, you already introduced the matter of the war, and that figures big in your wonderful book. Um, can you tell us a few of the things that became sort of commonplace in the war. Let's talk about the whole issue of food, for example, like yeah. ration stamps, shortages, gardens, things like that. Yeah. I guess to start, though, I should tell about uh, everybody in the community right. was involved in the war in some way. Uh, my uncle Jack had lived with us until uh, we moved to Hollow. And he became a bombardier in the B-24 mm -hmm. in the Caribbean hunting submarines. Uh, Joyce lived with us, and her husband, uh, Bill, was in the 10th Mountain Division. Mm -hmm. And he first, well, they were known as the uh, uh, ski, yes. ski patrol, and uh, they learned to, you know, go up cliffs and stuff like that. 
Mm. He was first sent up for the Aleutian Islands, mm. and where they, the Tenth Mountain had to uh, uh, push back the Japanese, right. and were you know able to take it back in uh, U.S. territory. And then he was um, sent, well, from the Pacific Theater, he went to the European Theater, and he uh, was in one of the two invasions of Italy, uh, you know, amphibious invasions. And somehow he stayed alive, alive all the way yeah. up through. And one thing that happened, he never recovered, was that his buddy, was just a few feet away in a fossil, and a moor came in and blew him all the pieces. Mm. And from that time on, he had the post traumatic uh, syndrome, mm. which back then they didn't believe it was that. They thought if somebody, uh, you know, got that type of thing, that he was a sister. Well, you know, Sam, it, it brings up the point that um, here in Hollowell, which was then as it is now relatively small in population that uh, 401 men from Hollowell served in World War II. Their, their names are on the monument in the, uh, in the cemetery. Um, and your point about how people all pitched in together all through the war years, whether they were in the armed services or whether they were um, local, um, local citizens, uh, it was everybody working toward uh, the goal. Yeah, my dad was one of them. Uh, he was too old to be drafted. So he became a uh, air raid warden. Mm -hmm. And that meant that, <clears throat> well, the fear was that the Germans would uh, uh, fly planes over to uh, the uh, East Coast and then fly down through Maine to a bomb Boston. Mm -hmm. So every one of us had a uh, big bucket of sand in the cellar <laughs> so that supposedly we'd go up in the attic or wherever it was and we'd pour sand over it and put it out. <laughs> and uh, an interesting thing about that bucket was that when uh, Black Cat was down in the cellar, she eventually used it for a litter box. Oh, no. <laughs> So we had to get rid of that. <laughs> right. She and, wasn't contributing to the war uh, effort. <laughs> my dad, um, his job was to go, they had, uh, he had headlights that were mostly blocked off. There was just a little opening in it. Mm. And he had to drive out and patrol and stop people that had their lights on. Mm -hmm. He came back after that and said, Boy, that's difficult to have anybody cooperate. Yeah. Well, and and, and people bought um, uh, dark shades, too. Mm -hmm. and, oh, and we had blackout shades. Blackout shades, yes. Yeah, we had a uh, very low light, and mm. we had to pull the blackout shades as well. Mm. And so... Um, now, was there a, an, an aerial observation location? Yeah, the aerial observation uh, location was up. Uh, on the west side of uh, um, High Street. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was raised up a little bit on stilts. <laughs> and uh, it, the observation part was in the uh, upper story where the windows went all the way around it. Mm -hmm. And there were uh, charts of, you know, of different planes. Right. And my dad and other people would, I think they, well, they, they kept it open 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. And um, they were, the U.S. was flying all kinds of planes to Europe. And uh, they would go over our area. And then there was a phone, like a red phone. And then we had to call headquarters and tell them <laughs> what kind of plane they were. But headquarters wasn't too far away because, uh, Camp Keys was at the airport. Oh, sure. <laughs> right. And, uh, <laughs> Just a few miles north. <laughs> you know, there were temporary barracks and all kinds of things. And, uh, one of the planes, the P-38, uh, was forced to land in Augusta. 
and the airport was very short, and the runway was very short. So I went over the end of the runway and ended up in a gravel pit. And when it did, the bullets inside went off, and uh, he was uh, wounded. Oh my! Midst of the um, now, speaking, you spoke of, of course these, you know, looking for enemy planes, which fortunately yeah. never came to Hollowell. Um, but now the war did come to, to the coast of Maine. Yeah. Uh, one thing, if I could add. It. Oh no, you go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, the air raids, we had air raid drills, mm -hmm. and my dad was one of the Frenchmen for that. And one was held in the day, and uh, an ambulance came to our house, <laughs> and I was strapped to a litter <laughs> and put in the back of the ambulance and uh, taken down to the field hospital, which is in the cellar of the uh, Worcester house. <laughs> and they looked me all over and said I had burns and banished me all up. <laughs> and I told my dad, that was so embarrassing. Never have me do that again. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> well, you that was part of your pitch for the war effort. Yeah. <laughs> right. Now your other question. Yeah. Um, wanted to just touch on um, which is mentioned in your book about uh, the German spies landing in oh, Hancock. Okay. Um, some German spies, well, there are submarines off the coast all over the place. And my dad and his friends, when we went down to the coast, uh, would uh, use their binoculars and they could see the submarines. And um, so they were really operating in the Gulf of Maine. And one morning, a uh, Boy Scout went down to the beach and started looking around, and he found uh, wet footprints in the sand. But they didn't go down, they just came up. So he told his dad, and his dad um, alerted the FBI. And the spies got on a train and we're traveling to Boston. I think they went through Lewiston. Mm -hmm. They didn't go through Hollow. <laughs> right. <laughs> but they went through Lewiston and uh, they were picked up. Mm -hmm. And that was the end of that. So they had uh, nice quarters until the end of the war. <laughs> yes, indeed. Indeed. Um, now, the war was, of course, a very serious time, but you did have some uh, entertainment. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, most of the entertainment was uh, City Hall. Mm -hmm. And uh, I liked City Hall. And there was uh, in the library, there was the tunes. <laughs> <laughs> and when nobody was looking, I used to sneak over and <laughs> look down on them and then they believe I didn't say it. <laughs> but the entertainment, uh, there would be school plays, um, there would be, uh, well, the high, high school ballet, uh, graduation was there and things like that. But one of the real interesting things was uh, the minstrel shows. And back then, uh, blacks were not exactly of the way they are today. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, the minstrel shows, some of them were sponsored by the uh, Knights of, of Pythias. Pythias, and then others were sponsored by hollow churches. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> and what happened was that there was an interlocutor in a grass skirt. And then half the end men sat on one side of the stage and half on the other. And the um, when the end men got up, they would make a, a joke about some local businessman. No. <laughs> and uh, one of the jokes I remember was that, uh, well, first of all, too, the end men 
had to do a little, well, they sang a song and then did a little dance and then they uh, had the joke. And the one joke I remember is that the uh, mayor, Mayor Babbitt, went down to uh, Hayes' Bakery, which was a favorite, and he uh, he asked, uh, the bread looks a little stale. <laughs> and he said, um, is this bread stale? And uh, um, is it, was it baked today? And uh, Sam said, uh, <laughs> I'm losing my punchline. It's okay, sir. Yeah, but anyway, it was, uh, yes. Today. Today, right. Yeah, yes, yes, yesterday. Yeah. Long, yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, now, in addition to the programs at City Hall, um, tell us a bit about the, the movie theater, the oh, Rialto. The Rialto, yeah. favorite place. Um, and, um, still, still standing today across it, the street uh, from us in, yeah, at the it, library. It um, was a church. Mm -hmm. Right. Started as a was it a universalist church? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, what happened was that uh, the church moved in the nineteen oh thirty eight. Mm -hmm. I think that was it. And the Rialto opened up. It was uh, one of the many theaters around. Uh, one in Augusta that was very popular was the Colonial, which is being renovated now. Mm -hmm. And the uh, Rialto, uh, most of us would go to the matinee on a Saturday afternoon. I got an allowance every week for all the chores I had to do, mm -hmm. and I got 25 cents a week. <laughs> that was very precious. <laughs> and I would go to the Saturday matinee for 12 cents. Oh my, well, that was half your allowance. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then I, I uh, bought candy that was sold nearby. Mm -hmm. And uh, that left me eight cents <laughs> for the rest of the week to do whatever I wanted. <laughs> well, you learned how to count your pennies. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the things they had there, um, <laughs> they would have a, a newsreel to start with. Mm -hmm. And then there would be a short. Uh, let's see, some of them were, I can't remember, but they were like the Bo Bo Bowery Boys and stuff right? like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then there would be a, a serial. And the serial is, uh, would be every week. And the end of every week, the uh, hero would be in peril. <laughs> right. <laughs> so we had to wait until the next week. To find out. Well, and it was and it was a way to get you back for the next yeah, week. And, uh, yeah. Um, and uh, my dad used to go Friday night with his friends, so they knew what the end of the serial was, <laughs> and we'd pester him when he came back, or the next day to find out he wouldn't tell. <laughs> and the feature movies were uh, like Abbott and Costello. Oh, yeah. But they had a lot of Western movies, uh, Gene Autry and all these other guys. So. And back for a moment, the newsreels probably were one way that you saw graphically what was happening yeah, with the war. One of the worst ones I ever saw that really shot me is when the uh, dead prisoners at uh, Auschwitz. Oh, yes. They were all piled in wagons. Yeah. And they were dragged off. And that was shown in that. It, it really, you know, it shocked me. Yeah. I, I haven't recovered from that. Well, yet. no, no. And this is the way in 1945 that the world learned about the Holocaust. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, boy. Um, let's turn just for a moment to winter in Hollowell in your youth. Oh, okay. <laughs> winter was a special time. There were two lighting. Hill, sliding hill in Hollow. <laughs> One of them, I guess, was uh, down in uh, the lower part, well, east, uh, southern part of town. Mm -hmm. And the other one was Summer Street uh, from uh, 
of the Litchfield Road down to the corner. Mm. And it was blocked off every winter. And uh, my friends and I, well, we became, our house became the uh, warming shed. <laughs> <laughs> and my friends and I would, uh, we loved to uh, uh, lead. Mm -hmm. And I had a speed away, which is very low and very fast. And some of our friends had flexible flyers. Mm -hmm. And the flexible flyer was higher. And the ends of the, uh, the runners were uh, curled up. Oh, yes, right. Well, it made a really great handle. <laughs> <laughs> We'd catch up with somebody go like that. And, and didn't you tell me, Sam, that you were, you were, uh, very careful. You, you you were always the guy on the back of the sled? Well, that was the toboggan. The toboggan. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was the other thing we had with the toboggan, which was a great deal of fun. Right. But now, did you actually go down some of the, the, the steep, yeah, steep hill? Yeah, that's an unfortunate thing. Yeah. There were some uh, friends from Lower Hollowell <laughs> who convinced me that I should run it down from Summer Street to uh, Second Street. And reluctantly, I said, okay, as long as I can sit on the back. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and just as we got to Second Street, a car came by oh and threw us, everybody, I rolled off. Yeah. <laughs> and I, everybody on the toboggan ended up in the ditch. Yeah. They just barely touched the car. But nobody was injured. Oh, my goodness. Uh, it scared the heck out of me, and I never did anything like that again. <laughs> now, Sam, let's turn for a moment to, in the 1940s, to businesses on Water Street. What are the what are the places that you okay, there frequented? Were principally, three places that I went to uh, that I remember going to them a lot. Uh, one of them, of course, was Boynton's Market, mm. and that's where we got everything that we were able to there. Uh, we had ration stamps. I had my own book. And my parents would buy me a pair of shoes. And I was a mud person. So <laughs> I'd be dead in about a, a week. But um, things that uh, dad got there would be, um, well, we couldn't get much beef. So, we were all trying to save money. Mm -hmm. So he'd get honeycomb tripe <laughs> and bring it home and my mother would try to get as much of the preserve out as she could and then she would fry it and batter. And one of my memories is sitting at the table <laughs> for a long, long time because I wouldn't eat my drink. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then we uh, got uh, chicken hearts and giblets and they were in a cream sauce. They were okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the other place that I went to a lot was Hayes' Bakery. Mm. And the, before it was taken up, they had this huge brick oven. And then, didn't that go way back into the 19th century, that oven? Oh, yeah. That yeah. went back into the 1850s, I think. Yeah. yeah. And um, it was wood fired. Mm. And just like, you know, in, in home where you had a bake oven and the ashes would be taken out with a peel and then the bread would be put in there. Mm -hmm. And the bread came out of around uh, noontime mm -hmm. and it was too warm to slice. He had a slicer. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would pick it up, take it home, and my mother would slice it and we'd put brown sugar on it. Oh, and it would melt in the bread oven. <laughs> the other thing was that everybody in town, young person in town, had his uh, birthday cake uh, baked at the, the bakery. And one thing that we all liked was that on the day of your birthday, the cake would be put in the window. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, your, your, your birthday would be on display. <laughs> uh, what birthday party can we get? <laughs> yeah, oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> An open invitation. Yeah, the other place was uh, Tibbetts Drugstore. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, Tim and Strengths were as we went to get the uh, Sunday paper. And my dad might let me buy a comic book. Mm -hmm. Some of them may be very valuable now, but I lost them. <laughs> right. And uh, they um, had a soda bar. Uh, and um, you would be able to get milkshakes and Sundays and stuff like that. Um, we went there sometimes during the week because when we had more money. And we all went there because uh, Carl Tibbetts would uh, hire the prettiest girls in the high school. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so it was an extra incentive. <laughs> yeah. That was a good advertisement. <laughs> Sam, was there a was there a candy store in town? Do you remember? Or? There was a small candy store. I don't remember the name of it. Yeah. Um, as I remember, it was run by uh, husband and wife. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. it might have been just called the candy store. Yeah. And yeah. we used to go there and get candy. But most of the candy, a lot of it in the early days, we picked up at the real zone. Uh, sure. Yeah. There was a fish market. Uh, there was uh, Adam's clothing store. Uh, there was a food store. Uh, there were all kinds of different well, stores. And, and Hollowell was still in its industrial stage in those yes, days. Yeah. There were the two big shoe factories still well, going. The shoe factories. Uh, well, there was the one where the cotton mill apartment was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When it ceased to be a cotton mill, it turned into a, eventually a shoe store. Right. A shoe factory. <laughs> right. And then there was the uh, Johnson. The Johnson brothers. Yeah. Yep. Johnson brothers that came later. And uh, it was uh, where the parking lot is for the. Uh, you right, right across the street here yeah, from the, and, from the uh, library. Yeah. yeah it, um, As I recall, it was a massive building, a massive was. wooden building. Yeah, yeah. it was. And uh, Arthur Moore's wife worked there. She mm -hmm. worked in the office. And I guess a lot of things went on at Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. But um, when we were initiated to the high school, we would be taken down to uh, Remy's Cafe and they'd feed us crackers and all kinds of stuff. And then march us up by Johnson Brothers. And we all had to kneel and uh, <laughs> sing the class song oh my. <laughs> to the people all leaning out the window. <laughs> so, so, Sam, um, w w as you look back on this, um, you know, the 1940s, um, and now we're now in Hollowell in the 2020s. Um, any any observations? Any any thoughts about yeah, the, the how things one, might have changed? Yeah, yeah, the big thing was that when the war was over, people could get tires, they could get cars, and the cars that had been used were uh, during the war were either junked or you know sold to somebody. And um, well, and, and I guess they, they they didn't make civilian cars during the war, did they? Or they pretty much stopped making. No, them, they stopped. And then yeah, the last thing is that uh, when people had cars, they couldn't compete in Hollywood because there was an AT in Augusta. Sure. And that took care of every little store in Hollywood. Yeah. Except for Boynton. Boynton survived. And uh, people drove to Lewiston. Mm -hmm. uh, and they drove up to Portland, and it was an easy drive both ways, except for the soft ones. <laughs> yeah, well, because, you know, by the time that I knew Hollowell in the late 50s and early 60s, because I was interested very young in collecting antiques, and my father would bring me up and we'd spend part of the Saturday afternoon, there were a fair number of vacant shops uh, along Water Street in the late 50s and early 60s, and many of the shops that had been these specialty stores that you were talking about had become antique stores. They did. And that was kind of the revolution. The antique yeah. dealers came in. Uh, we were known as the antique capital of the world. <laughs> That's right. Yes, and exactly. I think there were something like 
17 or 19 and how they were it was, all over it the was unbelievable in those days. Yeah. I mean, you would just walk up one side of the street and down the other, and most of the old stores had become the antique yeah. shops. And then they yeah. dwindled over the years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and now I would say that Water Street is probably as richly diverse as it was back yeah. in the 40s again. Yeah. yeah. It's come full circle. So we had a low power point, but then uh, like the Phoenix. <laughs> Absolutely. And Hollowell today is, I think, a, a very special place to live and work. It is. Really. Because yes. it's a mixed community. Mm -hmm. And everybody, a lot of my friends are friends and friends and friends. So mm -hmm. it, a has a, place. it has a very good spirit about mm -hmm. it. That's why I came back here after the serving in the army. Well, I think that kind of brings us full circle, and uh, maybe we can segue into some questions that our audience might have. For us. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sam. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, at the end of the war, uh, my mother announced that uh, Truman had uh, ordered an atomic bomb uh, bombed in, you know, in Japan and that the war was over. It was declared over after that. And I was sick in bed. And I couldn't go downtown. <laughs> and uh, so she let me throw a cake pan on the floor. <laughs> But the rest of the people went downtown and it was, you know, almost like a street dance or something happened. Okay, the next question is, what was the most important thing that the Klan freshman met in the 1950s, almost everyone was a Republican. Republican, is that accurate? Okay. <laughs> Everybody, well, I didn't get to it, but my dad, <laughs> I uh, was a Republican, and Mayor Babbitt and the Republican committee would meet at City Hall, they would caucus, and they just would decide who was going to run for this and that and that, and uh, as councilman. So my dad went down after the caucus and said that he was going to run anyway, <laughs> and he wasn't chosen. So he ran and he won. Uh, he was the alderman at large. And uh, he, uh, oh, some of the council meetings were really wild. Uh, when the man got so upset with my father that he said, let's go outside and uh, settle it with sister cuts, <laughs> which my dad didn't do. It was a big thing though when he was alderman at large, Davitt had to leave town and it was Memorial Day. So my dad got to be the uh, the mayor for one day, <laughs> rode in the car and, and uh, it was a big deal, but very short. Let me just answer that question also from a broader context. Um, of course, the Republican Party was founded in 1854 and there are actually some key players from Maine, like Israel Washburn Jr., who were actually at the founding of the party. And uh, the first major election that the party won was 1860 with Abraham Lincoln, with of course Hannibal Hamlin being the, um, the vice presidential um, candidate uh, on, that, uh, on the early Republican ticket. And from the 1860s until the 1950s, with a couple notable exceptions, uh, the Republican Party pretty much dominated um, the politics of, yeah. of Maine. And then uh, in this period that Sam and I have been talking about, there really was the beginning of a, of a major political shift and change, mm -hmm. which we are now still experiencing historically here in Maine today. And that was the election of 1954 and a, a young, uh, very um, uh, brilliant uh, very uh, engaging lawyer named Edmund S. Muskie from Waterville mm -hmm. ran for governor. 
And, uh, and to everybody's surprise, uh, he won. And then he was reelected in 1956 and then sent to the Senate in 1958. And it was Muskie's elections in the 50s that really shifted the political culture and began to uh, reestablish a two-party system mm -hmm. in Maine, which we now experience today. Yeah. Yeah. The next question is, um, how often did passenger trains run through Hollowell? Oh, passenger trains. Uh, okay, that's one. Passenger trains ran through Hollow many times. There were two sets of tracks, and you had to be careful, you know, crossing the tracks because two trains would be going, you know, opposite way. And <clears throat> the um, passenger trains didn't like to stop in Hollow because it was a grade up to Augusta, which was just a couple miles away. So my dad, who had to, um, didn't have a car, used the train. And uh, when he came to Hollow, the conductor would sit on the opposite end of where he was. And uh, he said, well, the man that wants to get off at Hollow, please come forward. So my dad <laughs> had to walk all the way through the uh, passenger car and people go, what the heck? <laughs> and then the final blow was when uh, we came up from Boston one time, my dad made the, the train stop in Hollow. <laughs> and the ultimate insult was as the train was pulling out, all the toilets were dumped on the track. Oh. Because that, back in that time, when you uh, went to the laboratory, you just opened a little shutter when you put and everything went out onto the tracks. Yeah. <laughs> Something you wouldn't see today. <laughs> All right, so we have a follow-up question to that one. Was, um, was there a station in Hollowell? Yes, there was a station in Hollowell. It had been there for years. Uh, one of the big things about the station was that it, uh, the hollow granite works um, by rail sent a lot of the monuments out in pieces and in the full, and they had special cars. So the railroad station was uh, very important. There was a, uh, a spur track that went off. And uh, that's where we, uh, it was located, uh, uh, let's see, just, to the north of where uh, the uh, parking lot, where uh, Jones and Chew was, and it was up on the top. I think they ran some scenic trains for a while and there was a, uh, little benches and things up there. It was, a, it was a very attractive little brick building. Oh, and, yeah. and I think it's, photo, I think there's a photograph of it yeah, in your book. In book. Yeah, yeah. And then like so many of the old railroad stations, when passenger service ended around 1960, the railroad just tore them down. Yeah. yeah. Well, that one didn't go. And, uh, oh. Well, it, it did eventually. Yeah. Um, the um, other thing was that one reason that the, uh, train didn't have to stop in Hollow because the post office would bring all the mail that was going out in a big bag. Ah, oh yeah. And it would be put on a stand uh, by the track. And when uh, the train got, came by, there was a hook mm -hmm. on the baggage car and uh, it would whip the bag off <laughs> into the... Uh, uh, Every reason not to stop in Hollow Well. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, next question is going back a little bit. When did you get a TV, or did you? Uh, <laughs> we didn't get a TV until the 19, I think it was 54 or 55. Mm -hmm. And Bangor had a TV before then. But we couldn't get it, get it. And what you had to do was to have uh, 
antennas. Mm -hmm. and the antennas in Hollowell, because it's a hill, had to be way up high. <laughs> right. And then the antenna had to be adjusted so that you could pick up the signal. And uh, we actually lived on 2nd Street when we got our first TV. And it was all black and white. And uh, people would try to make it color by uh, Oh, yes. Well, they got multiple colors. Of That's right. It was a cellophane that yeah. they bought that you put over the screen. Yeah. And it, it had, you know, like a blue sky <laughs> and a green landscape. Yeah. 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 I remember that. Yeah. So the next question is I've heard the smell from the river was very bad in the past. Could you tell us about this and how people lived with the smell? Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't really plan to bring that up if we had time. <laughs> Not only did, you know, like the train, uh, you know, open up on the track, but all Hollowell's affluent would, uh, from every home, would go in uh, on huge pipes down to the river and float into the river. Uh, on an early morning, it was so difficult to be down there because if it was a moisty day, it would, the smell would just linger. And in the 50s, the smell was so bad that my dad had lead face paint on the house, a big house, mm -hmm. and it turned the paint gray. And then all the suckers died. And then you had all the smell, you know, smell from the the dead suckers. It was it was a mess. Well, and of course this goes back to Edmund Muskie again. And when he got to the Senate in 1958, 59, um, he began to work for this legislation that was passed in the 60s and the 70s for clean water and clean air. Yeah. And the rivers, the rivers were then cleaned up in this in the 70s and the 80s. Yeah, and we used yeah. to celebrate that with the Kennebec whatever race. Yes. And yes. we would make. Well, I made a uh, uh, dragon canoe <laughs> that had a you know big head <laughs> on the top of it, and then other people would uh, take. Uh, some people would take the uh, gallon jugs. You know, milk jugs in a frame and put them underneath, <laughs> and then we'd, we would sail down to garden. And that was a celebration of the return of the river. Yeah, one time my son jumped in the river, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but he didn't uh, dissolve. <laughs> right. All right, so we still have uh, quite a few more questions. Um, okay. I want to get through them a little bit. Uh, what drew your family to Hollowell in the first place? What? What drew your family to Hollowell in the first place? Oh, okay. Place? Um, we'd come over from Vermont. Um, my parents had somehow um, survived the, uh, the depression. Um, when the, my mom and dad were married, uh, my dad worked for the Rutland Herald as a legislative reporter. And my mother was uh, the head secretary for Vermont Power. And when they found out that we were married, uh, they were married, my mother was fired. And uh, so she had gone to a, a secretarial school in Albany. So she was very well qualified. So one of my uh, grandfathers, uh, lent us, uh, lent them $500 and set it up so that my dad could um, start an independent adjusting company in, uh, in Augusta. And when uh, we moved to Page Street at one point, and then when my dad's business was successful enough, we were able to move down to Hollowell. What was your experience using the library growing up in Hollowell? Oh, God. <laughs> 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 
we would not be talking like this. What we would do, we would come down to the library and uh, look for books. And then we would talk to each other. And the librarian would get so mad and she'd say, stop you talking. You're not supposed to talk in here. <laughs> and then uh, we would eventually leave. question is, have you thought about producing a map identifying some of the places you've mentioned tonight and in your book? Um, well, there was a map that Roe has put out and I helped. And it has a big, it's called a walking tour of all of And it has, you open it up and it's, you know, really big, Paul Plummer helped us with the artists in Paul. And um, it identifies uh, some of the businesses, the homes, and uh, tell us a little bit about them. I wonder if it's still in print, uh, Sam. Uh, I don't think it is, but I gave the remaining copies to uh, Rod McIntyre. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. It well, was a, you know, it was a very helpful thing, and it drew a lot of people to Hollow. And it, it, there were even uh, trolley tours during uh, old Hollow Day that went around and talked about all the places. It sounds like that map should go back in print. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the other person that helped me was uh, a lady who was uh, the uh, writer, editor of Garden Magazine. Mm. So she was uh, very knowledgeable of mm. It's good to know about. Next question is, was there ever anything like urban renewal in Hollowell? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, we're still fighting it. <laughs> um, urban renewal came to Hull. Well, it went to Portland yeah. and destroyed the radio station. I mean, the railroad The station. railroad station, right. Yeah. It went to Bangor and destroyed- The whole downtown. The Not whole the whole downtown, downtown, downtown but part yeah. of the downtown. And in Hollowell, the um, urban renewal, renewal people wanted to actually tear down the uh, Riverside businesses. Yeah, all, all all of the blocks along yeah, along gonna, the Riverside. Yeah, they get rid of all of them. Yeah, and the idea was not only urban renewal but also to um, expand uh, to widen um, Water Street. Yeah, that yeah. was um, it was in the uh, late uh, '80s that there was another push and they were going to expand the roads down in Farmingdale mm -hmm. and Diana Gibson and other friends and I started an organization uh, called CARE mm -hmm. and it was uh, citizens against the uh, road expansion <laughs> <laughs> and we went to the uh, Farmingdale uh, town meeting and presentation by the DOT and I videotaped some of it. I had a old, you know, Panasonic, and uh, we told them that they were going to lose the trees and a lot of their lawns and everything. And the people got mad and told us we should leave right now, <laughs> which we did. But then the next day, people started. They realized what was going to happen, mm. and they were shocked. But it was too late to stop it. Well, I would just add that uh, I think Hollowell has been very aware over the last 50 to 60 years of protecting both its waterfront, Water Street, and the wonderful residential neighborhoods that it has. And both the earlier urban renewal proposals in the late 50s, the early 60s, and the highway widenings and so on have always been met. Um, with skepticism and opposition because people wanted to continue to preserve the special qualities of this mm -hmm. community. That would have... It would have changed things. So just the, yeah. You know, place that you pass. <laughs> exactly. As, a, as, a, as opposed to a place which is a destination yeah. and a place where people want to live. Yeah. Great. Uh, 
I have two more questions, and if anyone has any more questions, we're going to do a last call. <laughs> um, would you say Hollowell is better or has improved since you were a kid, or not? <laughs> In one way, yes, and another way, no. I think um, it's improved because um, of everything that's happened downtown and uh, it's become a very vibrant community. Um, the thing that, um, you know, the close knit neighborhoods in Hollow um, after the war uh, really weren't close knit anymore. And uh, the people that hadn't left Hollow some all their lives that never left, you know, the state of Maine. Uh, there were a lot of people that came in, as we would say, from away. <laughs> and they moved in and they moved out. And um, you you didn't know all the people like you did before. All right. And we have a comment from Jeff Hall. Um, he says, Hollowell is a Okay, I think there's a video that Bob McIntyre took. And um, I guess he would be the person to uh, find out. Some of the tour, though, is on the main memory network, hmm. or the pictures of it. Yeah, I, I, on the tour, I wore a black uh, jacket, and I had a uh, top hat. <laughs> And I carried a uh, an umbrella, <laughs> and uh, Chris Cart really liked that. So I was told I'm going to be part of the uh, the mural. All right. So I only see one more question, and that is from Dan. How did the construction of I-95 impact Hollowell? Okay, I-95. Divided all over in half. Um, there was the city side, and then the rest of it was wet. We termed it West Hollow. <laughs> um, we didn't get as many perks from public works, street lights, um, things like that because the budget was always tight and most of the stuff went downtown. Mm. And um, so the people felt that they left out. But when I became, I was the uh, city councilor for, it was then Ward, well, four and five, uh, Ward five. And I uh, was able to get um, some paving, and street lights and things like that were essential. But since then, everything has, you know, really been, we've been treated just like uh, the rest of the city. <laughs> right. So there's a little resentment, but it's all over now. <laughs> Okay. Well, that was something. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Earl. A, an exciting uh, presentation, some really interesting memories and some great adventures. I think that uh, my own feeling is that at some point down the road, we should do this again, because there's so much more of your experience in Hollowell that you haven't talked about. I think specifically of the railroad boxcar through the back window in the West Wing. I'd like to know more about that at some point. The railroad boxcar that went through the stained glass window on the oh, West Wing. Yeah. yeah. So, um, as we talked about when we started, this is our kickoff event for the annual fund for the Hubbard Free Library. Many of you, hopefully all of you, have gotten a letter from the trustees and the staff 
uh, letting you know that the annual fund has started and hopefully you have or will make a donation to the library. Our goal this year is $40,000. As of yesterday, we had collected uh, $12,750. So we've gotten off to a really good start and we hope that uh, that pace will continue and will uh, meet or exceed our goal. Now, as we've talked about before, Sam's book, um, here we go, Black Cat and Other Stories in a glossy white um, cover with uh, text and pictures is available here at the library, as Annie mentioned, for $20. We have three remaining copies that are signed by Sam and those are $20, but there is certainly a special cachet associated with having a copy of these books, of this book uh, with Sam's signature. So if that interests you, speak up um, or forever hold your peace. Um, the annual fund runs through June of 2020, I'm sorry, yeah, 20, 2020. We sort of run it on a fiscal year basis. So if you've, 22, thank you. 2022, there we go. I grew up in the 1900s. Well, not quite, but anyway, 19. So 20, adapting to 20 is a bit of a challenge. But in any case, it runs through June 2022. Um, and as uh, they used to say, give early, give often. We depend on your support. Um, your support in the past has made the library what it is today. Uh, we've accomplished an incredible amount of work this year. We've spent uh, so funds to weatherize and restore the last of the nine of, nine of the 12 um, stained glass windows at the library. We have a project in place that should commence in December to replace 110 feet of sill under the west wing of the library, which was built in 1897. And we have a project scheduled for January that will insulate the basement and install a large humidif a dehumidifier in order to uh, reduce the moisture down there and further uh, protect our collection of valuable uh, books, both on the, in the basement and up here on the second floor. So to donate, uh, so you can send us a check using the materials you got in the letter, the return envelope, if you like, or just send a check or come by with a check. And obviously you can uh, donate online. Uh, recently, We've set it up so that people can use, uh, I think it's PayPal, to make regular monthly contributions. So, not PayPal, what is it? Okay, do it on our donation page. Um, it's sort of the, the time process where you can, instead of sending $1,000, you can send 100 bucks a month until you get to $1,000. If that's too much, the point, basically the point is that however it's convenient for you, please um, take the opportunity to support the library, to support your library. So that's it from us. Uh, again, thank you and Earl. Thank you, and thank you, Sam. Um, it's really remarkable. Something I will tell my uh, friends and family about that we had two historians here at the Hubbard uh, talking about their experience in Maine, their growing up in Maine, and Sam's particular uh, experience here in Hollowell. Thank you very much and good night.